five. The hawks who want to open in April and the doves who are talking about July. Four. I think I'm probably pro vaccine passports. I know some people might criticise me for that, but I think if that means that we can hold a safe Olympic Games, then great. Three. There's a lot of kidology going on and a lot of judgments that the Prime Minister has to make, and the buck really will stop with him. It's got absolutely nothing to do with any form of phobia and everything to do with wanting fair opportunity in sport for those that are born female. One. We have lift off. Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. The number of daily COVID-19 cases has halved since early January. Less than 2,000 COVID patients are being admitted to hospital each day, 60% down on last month's peak. Almost a quarter of the UK population have now been vaccinated at least once. Hooray! Across the EU, it's 5%, just one in 20. With Boris Johnson due to set out our roadmap out of lockdown next Monday, the 22nd of February, are there now grounds for hope? Co-pilot Pearson, you're clearly feeling somewhat optimistic. (laughs) You've booked a summer holiday. Is that light at the end of the tunnel or an oncoming train? I'm preferring to see it as light, Liam. I mean, (laughs) apparently the good news is that from March the 8th, we can sit on a bench and have a coffee. So, um, hooray! And apparently Nicola Sturgeon has told the Scots that they might be able to eat out at a restaurant from June, but no smiling, no smiling. Yeah, as you say, we're all waiting eagerly on tenterhooks for Monday when the Prime Minister will outline his roadmap. I mean, the the leaks we've heard so far, hopefully schools will be reopening on March the 8th. And we've been fervently hoping for that. I am feeling positive, Liam, you know, not exactly bullish, but... Picture a little Welsh terrier skipping around your knees. <laughs> you're you're not a terrier. You're a little fiery dragon. <laughs> <laughs> well, Idris's bolshy younger sister. But as you said, <laughs> lots of things to be positive about, I think. All of the key figures are going down dramatically. Everything except vaccinations, which are going gangbusters. I mean, hopefully 16 million people vaccinated by today, as you said. Just astonishing. Just yeah, astonishing. Absolutely astonishing. About I think about 15.3 million of first doses, about 500,000 a second jabs. And really, that should mean that all the over 50s could be jabbed by the end of April. But I understand ministers are privately admitting that it could be done as early as the end of March. Now, Liam, if we have most of the over 50s and vulnerable younger people vaccinated by then, that would pretty much eliminate 95 to 99% of all COVID deaths. And that would bring us really into the risk range of seasonal flu. And I think that what people are saying now is that can we then legitimately ask if we wouldn't impose restrictions for flu, why are we doing them for COVID? And I think what we're seeing now is a kind of existential struggle going on politically and in the science between two versions of the future, which is either we do this zero COVID, no one is safe until everyone is safe, or we've got the COVID recovery group this week. You'll know, Liam, that they've just basically said to the Prime Minister, right, we want this all to start opening up. After Easter, there's no excuse. And I feel from everything I know about the figures that it's going to become increasingly hard to justify telling people they can't see their mum, really. And let's not forget, Liam, in May, we will, we will have the local elections. Will the Conservative Party want to fight the local elections with lots of restrictions, which as the weather gets nicer and you're just being told you could have a picnic in the park? Well, I can't have a picnic in the park in the cold with my 84-year-old mother. So will they want to fight the local elections with restrictions which are becoming increasingly onerous, particularly with all this terrifically good news about all the declining statistics? The political geometry co-pilot, as you say, is very, very complex. Uh, There's a story on the front of our own esteemed newspaper this morning saying that we won't have lockdown released until daily cases are down into the hundreds. So 
a thousand per day mm. at least. Two things strike me about that. That's still quite a long way away. We're at, at around 10,000 cases a day at the moment. The numbers are coming out with a, a big lag. So I say that with brackets around it, if you like, but they're nowhere near a thousand. And of course, the number of cases that we're registering depends on the number of tests that we're doing. And they also depend, don't they? on those PCR tests and those lateral flow tests, which many very eminent scientists have said do produce lots of false positives. On the other hand, astonishing rollout of vaccines, a wonderful combination of private sector nous political courage. Mm. There was a lot of political courage. The Brits backed the aggressive creation, manufacture and rollout of vaccines with hard cash and reputation. Both things very, very important in politics. Um, and we are doing extremely well. We're getting to the point quite soon where it may start to make sense for us to help if they want the help, if they'll accept the help, vaccinate our friends and colleagues in the EU. Because as we said many times on Planet Normal, we're very pro the vaccination and it doesn't make any sense to vaccinate just our island. However many people visit here, you know, we have to basically vaccinate the whole continent if we can and beyond. And that vaccine nationalism will get very, very complex. But what a dilemma Boris Johnson now faces. The 22nd of February, next Monday, it really is a big moment of political truth. And it will be followed, Alison, the next week on the 3rd of March by Rishi Sunak's budget, a moment of economic truth, mm. political truth, economic truth, huge crossroads, very, very busy news agenda. And it strikes me that the reputation of this government will be forged for the next year or so off the back of what happens over the next couple of weeks. Well, as you say, Liam, I mean, the, the trouble with this 1,000 cases a day target is we, we know that there are a number of considerable number of false positives. I mean, Sir Patrick Vallance admitted at one of the press briefings that there are false positives. So if they're still going to be testing in hospitals and care homes, which are huge right. sources of the infection, will we ever not be getting a thousand cases a day? And that's a big worry. By the way, we, we've been very interested, haven't we, Liam, on Planet Normal in the nosocomial infections, just to remind listeners that they are hospital acquired infections. And it's I love it when you use scientific jargon <laughs> that you that you didn't even know what it meant like two months ago. You know what? If I could, if I could unlearn the word nosocomial, you've I, been I, practicing I mean, that in front of the mirror, haven't you? <laughs> I just, I so don't want to. I, you know how little I want to be talking about nosocomial infections. But, <laughs> oh God, the uh, words we've had to learn. Oh, yeah. anyway, but yes, we the Telegraph actually had a terrific story a few days ago, which was that as many as four in ten patients with COVID in the first wave may have caught the virus in hospital. Now, Liam, if you let that sink in, if we've got 40% of infections, you know, in the hospital, and then you add that to the infections and tragically the deaths in the care homes, we are looking at a considerable majority of COVID infections coming in nosocom from nosocomial infections in those environments. And that once again raises the thorny question of should we have been using fever hospitals, you know, separating the, the non-COVID from the COVID very early on and pursuing an aggressive strategy of protecting the care homes, which is which is really something that you and I have talked about so much. But coming back to Boris's dilemma, Liam, I mean, I think obviously there's the politics. He's got the hawks who want to open in April and the doves who are talking about July. So there is this battle going on, but it's not just a political or economic dilemma. He's talking about he wants this to be the final lockdown. He wants to be cautious, but irreversible going forward. We've all got to be optimistic, but patient. But the reality is, Liam, is that for every one of us on Planet Normal who's happy to run a slight risk to get back to normal, and you and I will hopefully be vaccinated in the next month. Our parents have already been vaccinated. There isn't very much risk at all, as we know, to anyone under 50. But for every one of us, there are many terrified people, Absolutely. I know this from my dog walks, who are still leaping into the hedge when you pass them outside on a rainy day. Now, today, even Sage has admitted that you cannot get 
COVID on a beach, okay? So remember back early in the pandemic when people were saying, what are people doing on the beach? What are people doing in parks? You really would struggle to get COVID outside. And yet we have this deep-rooted psychological fear of COVID. And I think that could now be as big a problem going forward as the virus itself, which brings us, Liam, to vaccination passports from which a lot of people recoil from that idea, this idea that you need to have your vaccination and show a document to go into a theatre or a pub. Or even to go to work, Alison. There have been some firms who unilaterally Mm. have decided that their employees need to have had the vaccine. Well, that's right, Liam, but I'm I'm on the fence over this and that wouldn't have been my view many months ago and I guess lots of Planet Normal listeners would be, you know, shouting at the speaker. And that's also really unlike you, isn't it? You're usually you know, subtle issues. We've done this podcast for quite a while now. Readers have read your columns in many cases for many, many years. When you decide on something, you write about it often in primary colours. Uh, and, and we've talked about this uh, offline, haven't we? It is a very, very difficult issue. I like that description, co-pilot Halligan. Are you, you, you're saying I'm a mad Welsh Harridan, aren't you really? I know, I know. A, dr- a, dragon, a, dra- a dragon, a dragon. Yes, was the... yes. <laughs> a little a, one, a little, a, a cute, little one. cute one. <laughs> yeah, um, look, so vaccination passport on the one hand, no, that's not the British way. Oh my goodness, you know, invasion of privacy. Uh, should people even, you know, if they don't want the vaccine, the Nuremberg Convention says no one should have anything put into their body that they don't want. So on the one hand, yeah, I fully agree with that. On the other hand, I've got two kids in their 20s. My daughter works in the theatre. She hasn't been able to work, Liam, for coming up for a year now. It's the anniversary of her being offered a wonderful part. Uh, She's just trying, like, well, not, not, you know, lots. There are millions like her, kids who are trying to piece together a living from their flat bedroom Wouldn't make any special claims for her at all. She's luckier than most. She's struggling to make the rent, as so many of them are. My kids are saying, we'll have the vaccine. You have the vaccine, mum. Dad has it. Grandparents have it. Great. Theatres can open. We can go to bars. We can go to clubs. We can resume our life. And this, Liam, is the dilemma. I don't think the government will want to legislate for vaccination passports because they know that that will risk upsetting a lot of the Tory faithful. Big backlash. Big backlash. Big but backlash. will they discourage private companies from doing it? And will it then acquire a momentum? And hand on heart, I am very torn. And the reason I'm torn is because I see my children wanting to resume their lives. They've had a year stolen from them. And, you know, a vaccination possible. I think we will all have to have some kind of certificate to tell to, if we fly. You know, I, you, you said I've yeah. insanely optimistically booked a, booked a holiday in July. <laughs> I mean, I'm still trying to figure out all the cancellations from last year, you know. Um, so I'm so basically any holiday this year is free because um, Jet 2 com st- still owes me £237. But the reality, I think we had a listener, Planet Normal listener, who had been, I think, a stewardess and said that, you know, in days gone by, just having your little card saying you'd had your yellow fever vaccination, that, that, was, that was completely standard. Absolutely. So will our natural aversion to being kept tabs on in this way, will that outweigh the very real, I think now, desire, indeed desperation to really reclaim that liberty? And and with so many people's mental health under strain, I think that that's something we have to think about. What what do you think? What's What's your gut instinct? I'm like you, I'm on the fence, but that's much more typical for me than, than than for you and and I and I say that in a self-deprecating way I think it's interesting the way it's developing you've got the the Greek leadership of course uh, an economy very reliant on tourism yes. they're saying that we need this vaccination certificate and of course the British government can say oh if you want to get a vaccination certificate that's fine the BMJ has been kicking back we've had quite a few emails from planet normal listeners on that and I've seen letters on newspaper letter papers is saying that doctors don't want to get involved in having to write letters for the whole mm. of the population. Mm. I think there may be some kind of private sector, a spontaneous solution where once you've had your 
jab, once you've maybe had a PCR test, uh, mm. notwithstanding the false positives, or some kind of proof that you've at least made the effort, it may be through testing rather than a more accurate testing rather than the jab, then you can have an app on your phone. And most people have a phone or people that don't mm. have a phone can then get a piece of paper with a barcode maybe. And that will then show that you are somebody who can be on an aeroplane or in a nightclub or another area where people are in close proximity. I think the government will resist very, very much to the full extent that they can legislating to make people have a vaccine because, you know, we're very, very lucky in this country. Mm -hmm. We have a very low proportion of people who are sceptical of the vaccine and long may that mm. continue. I think very, very different in, in many continental countries, the French in particular. And that really speaks volumes of, for all that we kick the governments in the shins and we have throughout our careers, of course, governments of all stripes, British people generally believe that the state is trying to do the right thing. Now, that will sound heretical to lots of planet normal <laughs> listeners tearing their hair out over recent months, but there is that basic respect for authority and the state, which is, you know, it, it, it's a British thing. It's the British way. So most of us, the vast majority, think if the state wants you to take the vaccine and all the regulatory checks are in place, you should then take the vaccine. So Claire, you know, our lovely London GP, she's yep. been in the front line vaccinating. And she said, although it's going well, she's increasingly finding people saying, does the vaccine, you know, does it really work? Because if it did, why aren't they why exactly. aren't they lifting the restrictions? So I would say that the government in its caution, which, you know, may be justified, but if it's going to be cautious, you're going to start getting a lot of certainly, you know, younger people, not 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 the older people who obviously are at great risk, but you you do run the risk of younger people or people in their middle age thinking, well, hang on a minute. If we're going to get this vaccine, where's the cube of sugar at Absolutely. the end? So I think that it's not straightforward to, to keep all the restrictions battened down and expect the vaccines to, to go, you know, the, the vaccine cooperation, which, as you say, has been excellent. We, we shouldn't take that for granted if people can't see a bit of hope coming. And it's two pronged, isn't it? On the mm. one hand, the more you coerce people to take the vaccine, the more you're going to galvanise opponents and fan the flames of that anti-vax mm. movement, which is there. It is It is there. It's just human nature. And the more you don't lift lockdown as increasing numbers of people are vaccinated, the more people are going to think, well, why are we having this vaccination then? So there's a lot of kidology going on and a lot of judgments that the prime minister has to make. And the buck really will stop with him as he tries to navigate all those moral dilemmas that we've just outlined. But the other huge factor in his decision making and the cabinet's decision making, Alison, is, of course, the economy, mm. because the longer we stayed locked down, it's not controversial to no, say this. It's no. just a fact. And remember when it was controversial to mention the economy? Oh, Crikey. Yes. Um, the longer we stay locked down, the more you're going to get businesses folding, more unemployment, the more you're going to get people suffering from depression and deaths of despair as their finances collapse and they get into debt, bankruptcy. We've seen all of this happening in recent months and nobody wants it to carry on. So I think it's the economy also that's going to be pressing on Boris as we approach not just the 22nd of February, the moment of political truth, but the moment of economic truth, Rishi Sunak's budget on the 3rd of March, probably the most important budget, certainly, of my lifetime. We know that furlough ends at the end of April, isn't it? Is that right? And I think that, you know, up to now, people have been perhaps sedated or bubble wrapped against the, the full economic reality. I've spoken to some people, employers, who've said that their business is effectively finished, but their staff are on furlough because they wanted them to carry on having the furlough at least until the end of April. So how many will become redundant as that furlough ends? And this week, Liam, we've had statistics, um, studies showing 450,000 families are behind with the rent. And these are among the poorest families. They're not homeowners. And there was a prediction that 40% of hospitality businesses are set to fail by the autumn. Now, that's another big sector of our society. So let's just not point the finger of blame always at the government. Let, no. Let's look at the opposition. Um, 
Well, I use the word opposition in three sets of inverted commas. I mean, all that, you know, Sir Keir Starmer hasn't been leading an opposition, has he? He's basically been not just agreeing with the government, but complaining all the time that they're not going far enough, soon enough. That's basically his entire shtick. He's wanted ever more lockdown, ever hasn't more he? He's lockdown. wanted ever more lockdown. Liam, how does the left end up constantly on the wrong side of the debate, not defending the rights of working people? Because we know that overwhelmingly the people who are suffering during this lockdown are ordinary working people, aren't they? They're people who haven't got the luxury of staying home, work from home, all that nice thing, you know, let's bake some more banana bread. I'm sick of banana bread. I'm just sick of it. (laughs) I, I never want to see banana bread ever again, let alone eat it. You haven't had mine. I'll send it in the post. <laughs> Caution, heavy package. <laughs> Caution, heavy that package. icon with a bloke breaking his yeah. back and a red line through <laughs> <laughs> No, well, we'll talk about my new diet in a minute. But, but so I think if you think about this reopening schools, OK, so Nicola Sturgeon's just leapt in now. Some year groups in Scottish primaries will be open from next week. That's going to put huge pressure on Boris Johnson. Huge, huge pressure. pressure on Boris We don't hear a dicky bird from the biggest Scottish teaching union. Surprise, surprise. No, no, they're all on board with Nicola. So you see, it's a bit of a stitch up, isn't it? The English teaching unions, who I think have been among the most reprehensible people during this whole pandemic, absolutely disgusting. Anne Longford, you know, she's the outgoing children's commissioner. And she said this week that British children will have lost 850 million teaching hours from COVID school closures by March the 8th. Not all children have got, you know, parents who are physicists or historians at home to fill them in. We've heard from many parents who are absolutely struggling to earn their living at the kitchen table while telling little Joshua about the slave trade. And it's not easy. And I really think that one reason that Boris is being cautious about the school reopenings is because he's caught in the sort of clashing rocks, if you like, the Scylla and Charybdis of Starmer on the one hand and Sturgeon on the other. How does he steer a course between these people who are urging him to be more draconian and then, lo and behold, turn round and will will say, this is disgusting, he's betrayed British children. Just you wait for that moment. And it's absolute hypocrisy. And I would say they were absolute villains of the piece. And Liam, some good news, Starmer's personal ratings are absolutely going through the floor. Okay, so 41% of people in the YouGov poll this week think that he's doing badly as the leader of the Labour Party. And I'm really glad that he's not cutting through because he hasn't been presenting. It's been uh, left the COVID recovery group and 63 Tory backbenchers to come up with any really practical alternatives. And if that political dilemma, which you outline, isn't hard enough for Boris Johnson to navigate. Then, of course, you got the choice which Rishi Sunak faces ahead of the budget on the 3rd of March. Does he extend furlough? I don't think he has any choice. That means more money printing by the Bank of England. You think he will extend furlough? I think he has no choice. I think he'll definitely extend furlough. And you've been very patient in recent weeks, Alison, because I've been beaming in and recording Planet Normal from from Burnley, from Middlesbrough, from you, Edinburgh. Yeah, you have. All of it COVID compliant travel. Uh, mm. I've got my letter saying that public service broadcasting is is fair game because I've got a documentary coming out on Channel 4 dispatches on the 22nd of February. And what I'd say to Planet Normal listeners is a bit of a taster is that the level of economic degradation that the documentary unearths, the businesses suffering And the really key message that came out of that documentary for me, and we're literally Mm. just putting the finishing touches to it now, Mm. um, is that it's not just the poorest who are suffering during this pandemic. You've got many, many people who were in good jobs, uh, in decent homes, who have been going to food banks, who have needed help, who have been facing economic degradation, whose family life has collapsed Lockdown has really hit the economy very, very hard indeed. And that's why the Conservatives, for now at least, are going to have to just keep spending money, whatever their instincts about borrowing and spending and the UK living beyond its means. 
Well, I'm sure I speak for all Planet Normal listeners, Liam, when I say that we finally, because you're going to be on the telly on Monday night, we'll get to check out whether you actually look like Alec Baldwin <laughs> or late period Noddy Holder. <laughs> or indeed Blakey from On The Buses. I hate you, Butler. <laughs> so... I hate you, Butler. <laughs> Hello, former England hooker Brian Moore here. Well, the Six Nations is back and so is my podcast, Brian Moore's Full Contact. Each week we will get the biggest and best names from the world of rugby to dive into every rook, mall and TMO decision. You can't nab a front row seat this year, but with our podcast you don't need to. So just search for Brian Moore's Full Contact on your podcast app, hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss it. Last week, we invited the eminent pathologist Dr John Lee to visit us on Planet Normal. Listeners were full of praise for his logical, evidence-based approach to lockdown-lifting dilemmas faced by the government. This week's guest is rather different. She swam for GB at the 1976 Montreal Olympics, aged just 13. She won two Commonwealth Golds just two years later. Sharon Davis is, by any measure, an iconic British sportswoman. But she's also a TV presenter, a mum of three, and now a grandmother too. I was delighted when Sharon agreed to visit Planet Normal. And I started by asking her, with superstars like Rio gold medalist Adam Peaty on Team GB, how is British swimming looking ahead of the delayed 2020 Tokyo Olympics, an Olympics that will hopefully, COVID allowing, go ahead this summer instead? It's really hard, to be honest with you, to actually be 100% accurate about where we kind of stand because, you know, it's not like a normal year where we can see what everybody else is doing. And it's been so fragmented. And of course, different countries have been able to train um, at different levels. I mean, you can be damn sure that China have been training all the way through and they wouldn't have stopped anything. They would have made sure that their athletes would have had access to facilities. It's going to be quite hard, you know, to see where we sit. Having said that, Adam is just phenomenal and a head and shoulders above everybody else. We've got four guys that have been pre-selected for Tokyo. Fingers crossed Tokyo actually happened. They're all medalists from our last world championships. And then we've got some young girls coming through. So there's some pluses and some negatives to the year postponement that we've had. You know, what the negatives is that we've lost a few people that didn't have another winter in them. And the positives are that there were some youngsters like Abby Woods and Freya Anderson um, that have benefited from that extra year swimming. Now, I want to come on to those Tokyo Olympics because it's not absolutely certain they're going to go ahead. They were postponed from last year, of course. And I know you have strong views on why they should go ahead. But before we do that, I just wanted to talk about you and, and your childhood and your time in the pool competitively, as it were, a little bit more. What drove you back in those days? 13 years old, selected for the Olympics, goes to the Commonwealth Games and beating everybody by a mile. I mean, what was going on in your mind when you're 15, 16 years old, you were so driven. But, but you know what, Liam? When you're young, though, it's easier because every time you get into the water or you get on the track or whatever you're doing sport-wise, you get better because you are just getting better because you're getting bigger and you're getting stronger and everything is new and exciting. And there really isn't a tremendous amount of pressure. And people aren't expecting too much of you when you're a 13-year-old or a 14-year-old. The ones that have to deal with the expectation are those that have success and the general public are wanting them to be successful again so you know going into an, an Olympic Games as a past Olympian as a past Olympic champion is where it becomes really really tough because you've got physical expectation and the training but the mental expectation is probably much more difficult so doing the Olympics at 13 was just wonderful I was always really tall I probably didn't look very 13 year old and I just loved the experience and it was really useful for me then four years later to have had an Olympic Games under my belt and then, of course, you know, I had eight years out and I went back again in 92. So my first Olympics, I was 13 and my last Olympics, I was 30. And they changed so drastically in that time. And Tokyo for me, I think, be Olympics number 12. And that's a lot of Olympics. I must ask you about 1980. I was absolutely glued to the television during the Moscow Olympics. Younger listeners won't know maybe that we almost didn't go to those mm. Olympics because of the state of politics at the time, the Cold War. It's almost crazy to think about it now, but... It may have been that you weren't even allowed to go to those Olympics. In the end, Team GB did go to the Olympics. And you, of course, lost in your specialist event, the 400 metre individual medley, to an East German 
who later admitted that the victory was drug enhanced. You must have thought so much about that. Probably, you know, one of the defining moments uh, of your life. How do you feel about that? looking back now, more than 40 years later? Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's not like it was a surprise, though. You know, people talk about it as if, oh, well, how unusual. The East German female athletes were incredibly dominant. They arrived on the scene in the sort of early 70s and started to win things from absolutely nowhere. So there was no history of junior, you know, stardom or fame or improvement. They literally just arrived on the scene and broke world records, which doesn't happen. They were only dominant in women's events. They weren't dominant in men's events. They looked and sounded like men. They had muscle development like men, very deep voices, often five o'clock shadows, often very bad skin, which was as a result of the testosterone, which they were given through puberty, through no fault of their own. You know, this isn't something that they had a choice about because they were behind the iron curtains you talked about. But it was absolutely obvious to anybody that knew sport. And so the people that I am the most upset with is the IOC and the governing bodies who did absolutely nothing about it for 20 years. And so not only did female athletes lose out on medals that they should have won, there's a, a lot of young girls that are seriously impacted by those drugs. Hearing you there, it's through no fault of their own. That's a tremendously generous thing for you to say. And of course, now, years later, all you have in your mind is the welfare of those young women you competed against, competed in inverted commas. But at the time, you must have been absolutely furious. You had trained, you had absolutely sculpted your body and put almost every waking hour of your young life into that race, and it was taken away from you. Did that influence your decision, Sharon? And I remember being surprised by it at the time, as a lot of the country was, to then step away from swimming and pursue other aspects of your career before returning, as you said, in the early 90s. Um, it was a different time, Liam. You know, the, the biggest reason I needed a break was was exactly that. I'd been training six hours a day since I was about 10 years old. And it is very full on. All international Olympic sport is very full on. But swimming is particularly full on because it's quite antisocial. You're soaking wet. You know, you're know, you usually doing it at the same time as you're trying to be in school and college. Are and you a morning day. person? I am a morning person, thank goodness. Or at least I turned into a morning Good job. Person. Yeah, getting up at five o'clock every day for, you know, most of my, my young life. So I really just needed a break. And in those days, you couldn't do that. You, you couldn't take six months away from the sport. People just didn't take that time off. You either did it or you didn't. I was lucky if I got three weeks off a year holiday. And so I went to university in America on a scholarship to maintain that scholarship, which was at Berkeley because I was very interested in the academics as well. To maintain that scholarship, I had to swim. And therefore, you know, my scholarship was being withdrawn if I wasn't actually competing for the university. So I came back to the UK did a TV program called Give Us a Clue that you may or may not remember. Absolutely. It received 40 quid and got branded a professional and wasn't allowed to compete anymore. So it wasn't my choice to leave swimming. I was branded a professional for 40 pounds appearance on a TV show. God, the rules back then, just, yeah. just, just madness, just madness. Yeah, absolutely. It would have been amazing to have actually been in LA because, of course, it was a very, you know, spit for spat situation. The, the Eastern Bloc didn't go to LA in, in punishment for America not going to, to Moscow. And so therefore it would have been great to have been able to compete with, without the Eastern Bloc there. And it didn't happen because I wasn't allowed to because of that 40 quid. So that's when I went off and started working in television because that was the only option I had. You know, we didn't have lottery funding. I was in debt. I turned up in London with all my clothes in my car and two days later, everything I owned got stolen from my car. So I owned what I stood up in plus an overdraft. And that was it. And you were one of the best known young women in the country. I mean, they were different times, right? Yeah, they were really, really different times. You know, I'm, I'm very grateful that things have changed and so they should have done. But our athletes now are very lucky. Let's talk a little bit about lockdown. How you feel that it's been very, very difficult for young kids to go swimming. The pools have been closed. It's been difficult for us to exercise generally. What sort of role, Sharon, can sport play? Not necessarily elite sport, we'll come on to that, but community sport, exercise, play, and getting us out of this situation, getting the country quite literally back up and running. Yeah, well, sadly, we know that being obese, particularly being morbidly obese, has huge impact on our health and well-being, and COVID figures will, can show you that as well. So this is something that I'm hoping, the, the one positive that might come off the back of this horrendous last year that we've had is that we would need a serious kick up the backside to go right we have to manage our physical activity and our diet both of these things go hand in hand 
kids get so much more out of sport than just being physically active. You know, it teaches them teamwork. It teaches them discipline. It teaches them so many things. When I've got a 14-year-old son, as, as you mentioned, I've also got a 27-year-old and a 22-year-old. They've all done sport, but my 14-year-old is so missing his mates and missing yep. his sport. So is my 15-year-old. Yeah, you know, it's, and it's been... And it's that age when they're just really getting into it. It's just really paying dividends. Yeah. They're growing, they're getting stronger. Yeah, he was doing so well as well with things like javelin and county 400s and 800s and all of that has gone by the by for a whole year. So though he's lucky the most because he's got a mum that makes him go in the gym and take the dogs out and he is still physically doing stuff, it's nothing compared to what he was doing before. God, imagine having Sharon Davis on the side of the track, eh? just <laughs> cheering for you when you're doing the 400. Mom. My I'm, God. I'm just mum like everybody else. <laughs> That's fantastic to hear that the kids are following in your in your footsteps. How important is it then that the Tokyo Olympics do go ahead? We've heard more about the fact uh, the head of the Tokyo Olympics has resigned for saying that women, quotes, talk too much during an online meeting. Oh, my goodness. I know. I mean, how you'll be really close to this situation. How sure are we that they're going to go ahead? And why do we need them to go ahead? Well, I mean, I have to say, first and foremost, I hope they go ahead. Of course, safety is absolute paramount and we have to defer to, to, to scientific advice. And that will always be you know, the first priority. Having said that, we are still five months, more than five months away from the Olympic Games. And look how much can change in just a month. We've now managed to vaccinate 15 million people in this country. The most vulnerable have already been vaccinated. So, you know, give us another month and we're, we're going to have got another huge number of people done. And this is happening all over the world. I think I'm probably pro vaccine passports. I know some people might, you know, criticize me for that, but I think if that means that we can hold a safe Olympic Games, then great, because that's what it's all about. I don't think the athletes are going to have a problem with doing that if it's about safety again. If it means we have no spectators, again, it's a shame, but they'd still rather be there because they've just trained for four, five, six, seven years of their life for this one competition. Now, unlike you know tennis players who have a Wimbledon every year, Olympians get one Olympics every four years. And for many of them, it will just be one window of opportunity to win that medal, which will change their whole life and that they've worked their whole life so far for. So I would like to see us get there for the athletes, but also I'd like to see us get there for the world. Because I actually just think the Olympics would be really positive for everybody. We would thoroughly enjoy watching it. It would bring the world back together again at a time when things are quite miserable and we could do with something very positive. Now, you've spoken out in the past about uh, trans women being involved in women's sports. So that's somebody born a male who now identifies as a female. You've been criticised for it. But Tokyo is the first Games where you there will be new International Olympic Committee IOC guidelines on transgender athletes as an insider as an elite sportswoman as somebody who has enormous knowledge of this area Sharon tell us about those new IOC guidelines so the rules were changed in 2015 which weren't in time for the 2016 Rio Olympics so as you say this will be the first Olympic Games where you will see trans athletes under the new guidelines. Now, the new guidelines say that they have to reduce their testosterone levels to 10 nanomoles. 10 nanomoles is 10 times more than the average female. And if I was to start competing tomorrow with 10 nanomoles of testosterone in my blood, I would be banned instantly. So the difficulty I've got is that if you are born male and you have all the physical benefits, which we can categorically see is there because the difference between elite males and elite females is between 10 and 30 percent across the board and it's skeletal isn't it it's 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 pelvic yeah. size it's blood red blood cell it's count lung it's, capacity. It's, it's the muscle it's memory hands, you know hands um, and feet size obviously which is relative something like swimming it's your height it's your even your dexterity you know there's all sorts of different things which are peer-reviewed and absolutely categorically not questionable that born males have a biological advantage which is phys physical and sport is physical so this isn't about being anti-transgender this is just about being pro-fairness and my point has always been let's do the science first so if we're going to change the rules then we need to make sure that the science is done first and we haven't done the science we're literally just stabbing away at this the only science that's been done has been done by the main Swedish university. And they've come back and said that one year's reduced testosterone does not level the playing field in any shape or form. And again, that's peer reviewed evidence. 
So it's just terribly unfair. And for me, for someone that competed against these Germans that were put through male puberty and had a testosterone advantage, which totally dominated the world of women's sport for nearly 20 years, and their advantage was, was 9% on average, we're now going to give away between 10 and 30%. How is this fair? So it's, it's got absolutely nothing to do with any form of you know, phobia and everything to do with wanting fair opportunity in sport for those that are born female. When you've spoken out in the past, Sharon, three national LGBT sports associations here in the UK uh, slammed you as, quote, deeply irresponsible and transphobic. But you were supported, of course, weren't you, by Olympic medal winning sportswomen like Sally Gunnell, Dame Kelly Holmes. I mean, how do you how do, how do you feel when someone like you with your really you know world class knowledge and experience of sports is dubbed? deeply irresponsible and transphobic. That must be tough. But how do we have races that are based on feelings and not based on biology? And how do we police races that are categorized by feelings? I don't understand this. You know, feelings aren't something that we can define. So we have to race based on the fact that we have categories for a reason. And the reason that we've had male and female categories forever is because if we didn't, females wouldn't win anything. So, you know, as a female who believes that over 50% of this world deserves the same opportunities as those born male, I just find it really hard to understand that the human rights of females are being trampled on for something that I believe at the moment is just sort of is a woke feeling. And, and, I, and I absolutely 100% believe in time that this will change. But my point is, why should we throw a number of females under the bus to prove what we already know is that males are stronger or faster than women. And in something like boxing, you know, the actual power of a punch is 100% more from a male of the same weight than a female, which is incredibly dangerous. The only association in the world that have been brave enough at the moment, all based on actual facts and, and, a, and a very big conference that they did with specialists from all over the world is world rugby. And they've done this because they know if they don't, women are get, going to get broken necks. Why is the IOC doing this, Sharon? What's, what's motivating them? <laughs> the same reason that the IOC did absolutely nothing about East Germans for 20 years. And that's why I say I have absolutely no faith in the IOC. Such a shame, isn't it? You know, because they are the governing body that we look up to the most. What is it? Just politics? Cowardice? Yeah, I think it's politics. I think it's probably politics. I think it's the fact that, you know, that we do want sport to be inclusive. I want sport to be inclusive. And I probably think that the only way forward is to have a female protected category and an open category. And then that open category will, will accommodate transgender men who are biological females who are now on high levels of testosterone who wouldn't be able to compete in women's category because they would be doping. And of course, it then would also um, be inclusive for transgender women who are biological males. So I think the way forward is, is to have an open category where everybody is welcome. Sport has to be inclusive. It is for all, but it has to also to be fair. Now, in recent weeks, new US President Joe Biden is pushing to allow transgender people to compete in girls and women's competitive sports, you know, school and college level. Very, very important in the States, as you know, having been at university there. And Martina Navratilova, no less, Tennis legend, also proudly lesbian, a long history of campaigning for the rights of trans women. She's pushing back against Joe Biden. She's joined a group of high profile female athletes who are challenging the new president. She says the performance gap between male athletes and female athletes emerges from the onset of male puberty. And from that point forward, even second tier males can beat the very, very best females. This could be a turning point, couldn't it? She is an enormous voice. Um, but Martina's been involved since the beginning. So I've spoken to Martina several times. And two years ago, Martina, myself, Paula Radcliffe, Kelly Holmes, we put together a letter with 60 other Olympians and world champions that were all absolutely at the top of their game. And we sent that to the IOC and we asked them, please just do the science first. So then Martina has spoken out recently. She has actually been on board, you know, uh, talking about this for quite a while. The difficulty we've got is that the majority of people that you speak to see the sense behind this, but most people are frightened to speak up. Why are they frightened, Sharon? And why aren't you? Because for the same reason you already mentioned, you know, the, the criticism that you get and the abuse that you get is extraordinary. I suppose the reason why I speak out was because I had 20 years of watching other females lose out to East Germans. 
And I just don't want to see another generation of young girls go through that. I really don't. You know, Kathy Smallwood was a really wonderful friend of mine. She was a fantastic 400 meter athlete on the track. Never won a major gold medal because she was constantly beaten out by East Germans. Hardly anybody on the high street knows who she who she was. And that's so unfair. I've got friends in swimming who came fourth behind three East Germans at the Olympic Games. No one knows who they are. And it's just not fair. I'm, I suppose, maybe grown a thick skin over the years. And I realize that you can't please all the people all the time. And if there's a few people that don't like me because I speak my mind, well, too bad. I can't tell you how excited I was to talk to Sharon Davis, (laughs) uh, Alison, really one of the heroes, the heroines of my youth. And it's difficult to convey, isn't it, to younger listeners, just what a big deal it was when she was swimming for the UK for Team GB at such a young age. I'm just reeling from Sharon Davis' grandmother. Wow. I mean, just just to add, and she still looks so fabulous. And, you know, grandma, I mean, amazing grandma Sharon. You know, I thought that was an absolutely riveting interview, Liam. And it's so great to hear her speaking out. I completely agree that we should go ahead with the Tokyo Olympics because we know we need everything we can to boost people's mood. The world needs it. As she said, the world needs those games. The world needs it. But but also to hear her speaking, it shouldn't even be courageous, should it, to state what Sharon is saying, which is that it's not fair for female athletes to compete against people who, even with the reduced testosterone levels, will still have 10 times more testosterone than any female athlete. And as Sharon said, incontrovertibly, if she took that amount of testosterone as a female athlete, she would be banned. I really admire her for speaking out. And I think this is becoming a huge issue, isn't it? We, we, we've we seen the government this week announcing plans, I mean, for universities to strengthen academic freedom with the appointment of a free speech champion. And what we're seeing is, is institutions and individuals running scared of talking about transgender issues, because if you or I say that sex is biological, we could be shut up by being accused of hate speech. Well, no, because as, you know, listening to Sharon there, she's making the case for fairness. The trans debate, of course, is tearing apart the top of the SNP in Scotland. Joanna Cherry, a very experienced front bencher, who has been standing up, in her view, for the rights of female-born women if you like, thinks that Nicola Sturgeon is going too far down the route of the trans lobby's point of view. And also in the US, incoming President Joe Biden is changing the law so trans athletes, against whom we have absolutely nothing, compete at school and university level. That level of sport, of course, in the US is very, very important. And I think it's worth saying that Sharon Davis's opponent in that Moscow 1980 Olympics, Petra Schneider, Mm. it was her who requested that her own records be struck from the role of honour, if you like. Imagine her emotions when she had to admit that the races that she competed in and won in, and she was a great swimmer. She was absolutely a great swimmer, but they were drug enhanced. Now we come to some listener emails, a selection of the messages that you've sent to us at planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Please keep sending your wonderful, moving, informative messages to us. Liam and I really do love hearing from you. Here's one that caught my eye. This is from Anna, who's a wedding planner. Liam was talking earlier about the effect of lockdown on business. I'm sending you the What About Weddings letter we've sent to the Prime Minister and a picture of our team in the Great Barn here, indicating what a ridiculous situation we found ourselves in last summer when we could only do weddings for 15 in a barn big enough to accommodate 200. And then for the initial part of the opening up last July, early August, we weren't allowed to serve food drink so that the 15 guests would then leave here to go to a crowded restaurant along with many other friends' relatives to celebrate all partially subsidised by the government's Eat Out to Help Out scheme. And then Paul Scully, Minister in Charge of Liaising with Hospitality Sector, talked about weddings being super spreaders. He is so wrong. There is a big drive to get the wedding's message across before the PM speech on Monday, which is why I'm emailing Planet Normal. We've got so many desperate brides and grooms literally holding their breath, not to mention all our poor suppliers who are just desperate to work again. 
We are COVID secure. We have access to thousands of lateral flow testing kits and we see no reason why normal weddings shouldn't go ahead from May, particularly since the vaccine rollout has been so incredibly successful. The wedding industry has been well and truly crushed for the last 11 months and it needs to restart soon before it's too late. Anna, well said, Anna. I've got a very dear friend who listens to Planet Normal and she and her fiancé are really hoping they can get married in June. And Liam, I'm going to be reading the lesson. So that's that's well <laughs> worth opening up for, isn't it? <laughs> Here's one from Helga. My husband and I have been avid listeners since the earliest Planet Normal podcasts and have neck ache from nodding in agreement. With school children in all years and universities having missed nearly a year and possibly more, says Helga, shouldn't there be serious discussion about the pros and cons of repeating a whole school year? This would do away with the pretense that the time loss can somehow be bridged with all the anticipated fudges this would entail long into the future. Children of all school ages will be taught everything appropriate for that year. All would thrive, all would mature. The cleverest ones could study in more depth. And anyway, schools used to start at five, not age four at present. It may be radical to delay one year's intake for nursery to enable an extra preschool year before entering school, but COVID's presented unprecedented challenges. Looking forward to the next Planet Normal trip. Bless you for all you do. Lovely. This is from Susan in Florida. We get loads of emails from the States, don't we? We do. We do. Do you think we can get invited across across for a trip? (laughs) Anyway, Susan said she just listened to Dr. John Lee last week on the podcast. To hear a fellow pathologist echo so many of my sentiments helped recalibrate my sanity and regain equilibrium. I know you receive hundreds of emails weekly, but I can't emphasise enough how your courageous reporting and interviewing serves to boost the morale and mental health of so many individuals worldwide, and doing so while your own well-being is under tremendous strain. As a practising Catholic, and as this is Ash Wednesday, I'm going to light two candles at the church today, one for you and one for Mr Halligan, <laughs> and send up prayers of petition at the same time. Well, thank you, Susan. We need all the prayers we could get. Thank you so much. Here's one from Doug with a decidedly north of the border perspective. Dear cosmonauts of common sense. I like that one. (laughs) I salute you as your spacecraft soars majestically across the ether. One of the highlights of my week is splashing down on planet normal, usually on an early morning dog walk. Thank you for the variety of guests you have. It's so refreshing to hear balanced and non-historical comments on our current crisis. It doesn't take much effort to assess the political scene, says Doug of Scotland. Our First Minister reacts with trademark huffy indignance whenever anyone insinuates she's making the most of this ongoing crisis, delivering her regular Pyongyang-style briefings. (laughs) Do you think I want to be standing here giving these briefings, is one of her standard retorts. Mine back would be, says Doug, how idiotic do you think we all are, Nicola? Of course you want to be doing these briefings. It gives you a perfect opportunity to score points in your glassy-eyed obsession with independence. Deflect attention from your blundering ineptitude in government and take the gaze of media away from the Alex Salmond inquiry, which your own MSPs are desperately attempting to boot into touch. Best wishes, says Doug, from a fellow traveller. Oh, and we've got another Doug here, Liam. Where does it all end if the attack on every single aspect of our lives is to be scrutinised by historic England to make sure that our fathers, grandfathers and all our family's ancestors going back to 1066 have never exploited, been involved in or benefited from slavery or indeed any of the hundreds of connections left with it? It is impossible to find almost anyone in England that has not been historically involved in the slave trade. Every single trade, business and resource from 1700 onwards has had a link to the exploitation of every country and ethnic minority in the world. So we are all guilty and therefore should all be put in the stocks and pelted with rotten eggs, I suppose. We just can't change history to please the voracious few who are attempting to wipe the slate clean of all our mistakes. I know that we will never, ever go there again. All we can do is make sure that from here on we treat each other as we would want to be treated and for others to stop beating us up over actions taken two or three centuries back that we were not personally or directly responsible for and would never accept now. Well, well said, Doug. This is from Sarah. Thank you so much for your Planet Normal podcasts. I'm not sure if they keep me sane or increase my ranting and raging at the government. Either way, I love to listen to you both. Thanks to schools being closed, 
No half-term childcare, trying to work. I've had to take unpaid leave for all but one day a week so I can support the education of my special needs eight-year-old son. Generally going insane, etc. I don't have the wherewithal or time to write as eloquently as many of your listeners. I sound light-hearted, says Sarah, but actually I'm hanging by a thread. With the current situation and my own angry outbursts, tears and suicidal thoughts doing nothing to help the mental well-being of my husband or my son, who now has a tick and does a lot of humming, apparently signs of stress. Next Monday, we're going to hear more of the same from Boris. Case numbers down, blah, blah, blah. Small concessions that are meant to please us. Who cares what the case numbers are once the elderly and vulnerable are vaccinated and safe and the death rate is down? Surely that's what's really important. Thank you for hearing me out, says Sarah. And thanks so much again for Planet Normal. Don't worry about your writing, Sarah. You wrote that absolutely beautifully. Absolutely. Where Liam and I are sending you all best wishes and a, a big virtual hug from Planet Normal. This is from Phil, Liam. You'll like this. Hi, pilots. It must be a big letdown when you land back on planet Earth. Oh, Phil, don't worry. We only go back to pick up a couple of Twixes for Halligan. <laughs> We rarely go back. <laughs> so many things thrown at us aimed at raising the public's fears or sense of guilt. I see much of our population in one or other of the categories roundhead or cavalier. You know, roundheads are anti-Brexit, anti-business, obsessed with equality of outcomes rather than opportunity, anti-smoking, anti-country pursuits. In fact, most easily described as antis. I see Alison and Liam as cavaliers. You can just imagine Liam with a plume in his hat, leaping from his horse to free the golden-locked princess incarcerated <laughs> in some Welsh fortress. <laughs> I think, Phil, if Liam tried to, to, uh, to, to lift me onto his horse in the, pre the present, present state of, of teetering obesity, the poor horse wouldn't get very We'd far. need that heavyweight warning sticker again, wouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> we would. Keep it up, you two. Exposing real issues while keeping a sense of humour and proportion is difficult. You two do it so well. Thank you so much, Phil. As I will treasure the image we've done. <laughs> Liam with a plume in his hat. Thank you. And I've saved the best till last. You're going to love this one. <laughs> Dear Planet Normal, writes James, I've never written to journalists before. I was brought up to be deeply suspicious of the media. I'm an ageing old fart, age 62 for whom The Telegraph currently provides the only access to the outside world, living as I do in Northumberland. Notwithstanding that, I just wanted to thank you so much for providing me with a reason to be hopeful. I love your columns and podcasts. They make me feel able to breathe. Planet Normal provides me with the only thing which makes sense anymore. It's like that first whiskey of an evening settled in front of a log fire. <laughs> Long may your podcast continue. It's a breath of fresh air in a world suffocated by utter stupidity. <laughs> P.S. I am the better for two glasses of good claret this evening, as I write. Even so, I wouldn't hesitate to repeat myself in the morning. Thank you, James. Cheers, James. So that's it from Planet Normal for another week. Our sanctuary of sweet reason, our flying refuge of reasoned views. Alison and I will be responding as normal to your comments on the Telegraph website on Thursday morning, the day this podcast is released, between 11am and 12 noon. Do please leave us a five-star rating and a review on Apple iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast. That helps many other people to find us and helping the Planet Normal family to grow. So as we speed away from our beloved planet normal and the madness of planet Earth comes back into view, thanks as ever to our producers Reese Gunter, Louisa Wells and Elliot Lampett and our editor Theo Leludis. Stay safe and stay in touch with us and with each other. And until next week, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. <laughs> <laughs>